Since the Norman conquest of 1066, France and England for 350 years had schemed, negotiated, and fought over questions of sovereignty on both sides of the English Channel. England's King Henry believed he was entitled to lands in France. And to secure that land, he proposed to the king of France that he would wed the king's daughter. His hope was to get the lands he desired in a dowry, but he was rebuffed. And so Henry declared war. Henry's military career began at the age of 12. He had experienced the privations of siege warfare and while still a teenager was wounded in the face by one of a hail of arrows from the enemy. By the time he became king at age 26, Henry had emerged as a accomplished and brutal warrior. Fact is stranger than fiction in this tale. Henry decided that instead of setting up a fort, he would simply go capture one. But to do that required 2,500 heavily men of arms, 8,000 well-trained archers who could draw a longbow of up to 150 pounds, uh, assorted sappers, cannoneers, uh, catapults, battering rams and cannon nine feet long that could hurl a 500 pound rock projectile, and finally 10,000 horses. This entire mass of equipment, men, and materiel was loaded at Southampton for the two-day voyage across the English Channel. Can you imagine the chaos? Can you imagine the stench on the boats? Upon landing in August, 1415, the siege began. Some weeks into it, circumstances were grim. 2,000 soldiers had died or were uh, in, injured beyond capacity. Another 2,000 had contracted dysentery. Illustrations of the time show men with tunics and boots on, but no breeches or leggings so that they could respond immediately to the call of nature when it overtook them. Concern for morale, Henry disguises himself as Harry and goes amongst the troops at night, determined to ascertain their mood. Finding his men eager for the fray, Henry assembles them on the next morning. You are Henry's troops. Behind me is the fort of Harfleur on the Normandy coast. Henry approaches you and says, Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, Disguise fair nature with hard favored rage, then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock overhang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with a wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril hide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English whose blood is fet from fathers of war proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn to even fought and sheathed their sword for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you call fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in English, show us here the metal of your pastor. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips. 
straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England, and St. George! Words from William Shakespeare, written 200 years almost later. Henry V, Act Three, Scene One. 